The views expressed on this podcast are our own and do not constitute legal advice, nor do they constitute an attorney-client relationship. They also don't represent the views of anyone's employers. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Ready to future-proof your business with data and AI? This is Trust with Dominique Shelton Leipzig. Conversations about navigating the complex and evolving landscape of data protection, technology, and society. Here's Dominique. Hello, Professor Suresh Venkata Sabarinian. It's an absolute privilege to introduce you as director of the Center for Technological Responsibility at Brown University. You are a leading expert on the societal impacts of AI. You recently served on the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, where you co-authored the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. Beyond your technical work, what has really been impressive to me is how much you have distinguished yourself with a record of public service, including advising government commissions on privacy and preventing discrimination in automated systems. Dr. Suresh Venkata Sabrinian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Dominic. So before we dive into some of your actual work, how did you become interested in be becoming a research scientist to begin with, and then AI in particular? So one of the funny things about um, my original interest in computer science uh, was that AI was a part of it. I think reading about Alan Turing, reading about Turing machines, reading about the Turing test, these are things that I remember from my childhood as well as like, you know, I don't know, many other kids writing my own video games, trying to sort of implement them on very, very old computers that are now in museums, sadly, um, at the time. So that's where I started from. And I was interested broadly in all aspects of computer science. I was particularly interested in the mathematical side of computer science. And in fact, that's where I first started my work when I went to grad school uh, at Stanford. I was dithering between actually working in AI and working in theory, uh, theoretical computer science. And I ended up working in, in theory for a while. And that's sort of my, I guess, my, my, my heritage and my the way I approach questions as that mathematical framework. So that's so that's where it started. And I think over the years, I moved into different areas. I was working in uh, in an area called computational geometry, which tries to reason about geometric objects and, and design algorithms to do solve problems on them. That led me to thinking about not just geometry in the sense of our two-dimensional, three-dimensional geometry, but high-dimensional geometry which, as it turns out, is the basis for all the machine learning and AI, right? thinking about objects in high-dimensional spaces and finding patterns in those spaces. And the one thing led to another, I ended up doing uh, thinking about data mining, machine learning, an area I came to actually quite late in, in my career, relatively speaking. And then soon after that, I started thinking about what would happen once everyone was using machine learning everywhere. And that very quickly became a question of, okay, how are we going to trust the systems we're using? And then one thing led to another, and here I am. Well, it's a fascinating journey. And really, you were literally just right in the eye of what I would call the most monumental attention on technology that I've seen in my career. And it's been about 30 years practicing law that I've seen uh, so much, but I've never seen so many headlines and so much attention about technology, and in particular, AI. This must be very exciting for you, given everything that you know about it. But what are the biggest misperceptions that you think are out there when you see all these headlines about AI? There are misperceptions about what computer science is as a field and what AI's relationship to it is. There are you know, misperceptions about what it is that we think of as technology. So what do I mean by that? It is often the case and is often an, ar an argument pushed by some that technology is what is handed down to us by those who make it. That's all it is. If there's something we don't like about it, if there's something that we don't think is right, that's our problems. It's not technology's problem because that's what it is. And I think as a computer scientist, I think I, I find that, that perspective disturbing and disappointing because computer science, if anything, is very, very flexible. Is very, very malleable. And it's directed by us to decide how we want to make tech and how we want to change the world. It's a choice. It's not something that's a fait accompli that is just given to us. 
And so as a, as a practicing computer scientist who knows that we can choose to ask questions a certain way, we can choose to design solutions that benefit everyone, to say that we can't or that it's difficult or that it's going to limit innovation or it's going to make it harder to do the work, I think it's just fundamentally wrong and so lacks imagination. But the problem is that for those of us who aren't that familiar with technology, we don't have the resources and the knowledge just to push back and say, no, I don't think so. I think we can build better. I think we can do better. And if, you know, if I want to convey you know, perhaps one thing to those who are thinking about the use of technology, you may not be technologists themselves, you should say, you should be very free to demand what you think is necessary. And we can provide that. We, we have a lot we can do with technology, and we can also say when we can't. And that's the other thing that people don't understand about computer science, that we are actually very good at saying, these are problems we can solve, and these are problems we don't know how to solve, and these are problems that are unlikely to be easy to solve. We have a, actually f mathematical ways of classifying them. And we are comfortable in saying, okay, this is what we can do, and this is what we can't do. But we have to be, we have to have the right, we have the willingness to sort of expand our imagination of what we can build and not just be limited by existing frames. So much there to unpack and also so empowering to hear you talk about how much control that humans actually have in this process in technology and how much we can actually collaborate with research scientists such as yourself, the computer scientists, uh, to develop solutions that work for everyone. One of the things I've been really thinking about a lot is, okay, is it okay if I call you Suresh on the podcast? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's weird any other way. It's interesting. I mean, I went to Brown University and at, every time I see a professor at Brown, I just want to say professor or last name, but here I mean, we're sitting here speaking uh, relatably and I, I really appreciate you letting me call you Suresh. Um, but one of the things seriously I've been really thinking about is the degree to which business interests align with some of the headlines that I've seen. Early detections of cancer with AI achieving wonderful achievements uh, in educational opportunities and financial benefits through AI. There's some wonderful things that are anticipated for our global GDP. I understand from McKinsey that we're expecting $7 trillion added to the global GDP potentially in the next 10 years just based on generative AI. This is all so exciting, but I also see concerns about algorithmic disparate impact, privacy, IP concerns, accuracy, those articles are often expressing that there's a tension between this exciting view and this dystopic view and business interests. And when I think about the conversations I have with CEOs and board members around the world, they want their brands to be trusted. They don't want to be known for any of these uh, bad outcomes. They want to be thinking about aspirationally what AI can do. So I see so much alignment, and I'm just curious, how are you seeing that? And do you think there's enough um, enough collaboration between the business community and the computer science community? Oh, I think there's plenty of collaboration between the business community and the computer science community. The problem is there isn't enough collaboration between the business community, the computer science community, and the people who are actually impacted by this. That's the problem. And what do I mean by that? So if you think of the sort of economic business incentives to build quality products, right? You have a product, you want to make it a good product so you, more people will buy your product. You want to differentiate your product and give it features that people want compared to, say, other competitors. And that's the incentive. There's a direct relationship you have with the people who are using your product and who pay for it. The problem, I think, that we're seeing with a lot of the harms associated with technology is that we've somewhat disconnected this relationship that businesses are providing products to clients who pay for those products and use them, but the impact is being felt by people who are none of these, who are essentially the data that gets fed into these systems, but who have no voice in these economic transactions, these financial transactions. If hiring software is being used to decide whether I go forward in an interview process, I am not the person who made the software. I am not the person who buys the software. That is a different relationship. But I'm the one who's being affected by it. And so my concerns as an individual, my concerns as a member of a community are not being heard in this, in this design. And to me, I think that's, it's not the only source of problems, but it's one source where if we are saying that we want to allow innovation to function and work 
and businesses to do what they do best, which is you know make products in a way that's efficient and you know financially reasonable and cater to the customers. We've disconnected the relationship to the people who are being impacted the most because of advert ad supported revenue generation, because of rampant data collection for many reasons. I mean, there are many reasons why this has happened, right? But because of that, we businesses are no longer able to be responsive to those who are most affected by the tools they build. So how, how are you going to build products that serve everyone if your livelihood in your business does not depend on hearing from everyone? And the only impacts you face are to some extent, and to a very small extent, frankly, reputational impacts that are a concern, but are not the same thing as the concerns that affect your bottom line. You know, it's interesting because the corporate community that I represent and meet with on a regular basis sort of tell me just the opposite, that they are concerned about how their brand appears on a bigger scale. They don't want to be associated with bias, IP violations, inaccurate data, and so on. They're interested in figuring out how to resolve this and how to avoid these things ahead of time, not waiting for a disastrous headline that involves their product and their brand related to AI. They want to have it all be, for the most part, you know, you can't guarantee and future-proof against every harm, but for the most part, uh, they want to be known for the good things, finding cures, elevating education, advancing the employment process. So I think there's a disconnect here between what maybe the perception is that is just pure transactional business to business licensing AI to business providing AI. And we've been looking at some of the bank failures and other things like that. How quickly a company can be here today and gone tomorrow without necessarily the impacts being actually outside of them. Just a social media viral situation associated with a perceived term um, can make the difference between a business being here today and not here tomorrow. And so let's just go on the hypothetical, just humor me here. If we take the position that at least some listeners to this podcast would like to avoid harms that are leading businesses and they want to avoid harms with AI, even if they won't harm their particular business customer, but they're looking at society at large and they really want their brand to be synonymous with data leadership and innovation and all of those things as they use AI. Is there anything in the White House AI Bill of Rights that you were deeply involved in? Is there anything in there that could be helpful? And if so, maybe talk with us a little bit about what that document is, and we'll make sure to put it in the podcast notes. What is that document? What role can it play? And if there was a CEO or board member listening and was interested in cracking it open, what would they find? So I think that's a very good point, and I would I would answer it in two ways. I think there are at least two things that are that speak directly to the desire of the folks listening on to really have a, a trustworthy brand that actually does, as you say, all the good things. Number one, I would say is trust is a relationship, and building a relationship with those systems are impacting means that you're open and transparent and clear about what you're doing. You're able to acknowledge when things don't work, and you're able to make course corrections and, and adapt when you do so. So that's one thing. The second part of this, I think, is a recognition. Especially in AI, it's more true than ever that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. In many, if not all, of the most egregious cases of harms coming from technology, it is not the case that the folks who are developing the system thought they were doing something bad. They genuinely thought they were trying to improve a system, make it better, make it better for people. And yet in the very desire, in that, in the seeds of that desire to do good became the problem of it actually overreaching and doing bad. So I think two things to remember. There is no free lunch when it comes to AI systems that you can get benefit, but not for free. And you have to be very thoughtful and careful about it. And you have to build trust through transparency and accountability with those you are impacting. How do you do that? So you asked about the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is a, is a document that has many parts to it. The first part, the most important part, is five principles to protect people um, in an algorithmically driven society. Basically saying that systems that affect people in any material, impactful way should be safe. They shouldn't harm us. They should be effective. They should do what they're promised to do. They shouldn't discriminate. They should use our data conservatively. They should be clear and explainable. And they should account for failures by allowing backups, 
ways to talk to people, right? Not just for fully automated systems. That's it. Five prime principles, very simple. And the rest of it, of course, is as you as you have, you know, you have, I know you've spent a lot of time studying all these different documents and frameworks. A technical companion that says how you might go about achieving this. So getting back to our point about trustworthiness in brand and relationships and acknowledging that in order to achieve the good that comes with technology, you have to be very conscious of the risks and the bad at the same time. Throughout the document, we have you know guidelines for how to do reporting, how to do independent evaluations, how to bring stakeholders into the design process from early stages. You can think of all of these, and I, I didn't think of this till you asked the question, but you can think of all of these as ways to build trust with those that you're impacting. And there are specific technical mechanisms as well as governance mechanisms to be very clear and open about what you're doing, what you're doing that doesn't work, what you're doing that does work. I, I think of, for example, work in computer security, where there's a, there's a rich ecosystem of companies that work whose job it is to find bugs and systems, to find security breaches. Now, they don't go and just tell the whole world there was a security breach. That in itself is a breach of trust. They go and tell the company, say, hey, you need to fix this. You need to fix this problem. But they don't also keep quiet about it. They say, once you fix it, we're going to tell the whole world what happened. And you can say that you've already fixed it. But other people need to know so that we, no one else makes the same mistake next time. There's this collective learning and growth, even as mistakes are made. And that's okay. As you said, right, we can't be perfect from day one, but we can learn from mistakes and be transparent about them. So I think building in that trust, that transparency, that accountability, acknowledging that independent evaluation is actually a good thing because it helps build that trust, and being realistic and conservative about what technology and AI can do for you, not buying into the hype, are important parts of, of doing what you are saying you know, companies want to do, which is build these reliable brands. And this is where the Bill of Rights can help. This is so helpful. And I love how you focused on trust here because it's a word I've been thinking a lot about, you know, the podcast name, but also because it is reflected in draft legislation in 37 countries and six continents. They're called trusted legal AI frameworks. So legislators are working on this, on terminology to capture and codify the word trust. And I understand the Europeans will have their law, at least it looks like, heading towards adoption in Q4 2023 but also that the scientific community is looking at the word trust. And I hear our business leaders and uh, looking at their annual reports and for public companies, a lot of use of the word trust. So it seems like we all wanna get there. And then the question is, how do we do that? And triangulating and cross-pollinating. So I think that that's what I heard you say, Suresh, that is taking scientific information from the technical companion in the AI Bill of Rights and absorbing that as business leaders, and then reaching back out to impacted communities and evolving together might be a recipe, you know, in there somewhere for trust to emerge. Of course, uh, that brings me to another question. I see that as an outcome, but what motivated you to begin with? How did you get into this field? So when Dr. Alondra Nelson first joined, I think, uh, OSTP, she had this very clear idea that when we talk about science and science policy advising, we have to think about society as well. So she, you know, the division that she led at the time was named, originally named science, but she renamed the science and society. And that's very important. I think from early on, it was, you know, it was very clear. And, you know, I joined a few months in and she joined, you know, in the beginning of the first day of the administration, that we are at a moment where the question is no longer how we can generate policy to help foster the growth of technology that has been successful. The question is, how do we generate policy to navigate and guide technology as it impacts society in a way that's beneficial for all? That was the, the call of the moment. And so a Bill of Rights, right, a protections for people in an AI-driven society is a, is a natural way to think about this. It's, it's not putting the technology first. That's not what we want to do. It's putting people first and saying, you know, Technology will come and go, they'll evolve, they'll change, that's fine. But the fixed points are us. We are the ones who are experiencing tech. What do we want? And that is the was the guiding motivation for putting together this document. And that's why it looks different from, say, for example, a risk-based approach or a lot of the other product safety-based approaches that you see that are also reasonable approaches, but are putting the technology first in the center and saying, okay, how, this is the object we're studying. How do we make it safe? We're saying, no, no, we're putting people in the center. We want them to be safe. Technology needs to adapt to what we want. 
not the other way around. So thank you for that. And at that motivation, and and also it's a pretty significant departure from the focus that has been in the creation of technology up to that point. So this is really representing a, is it fair to say, a sea change in terms of perception? I wouldn't say that necessarily. I would say it is a, to me, it just felt like a natural evolution of our thinking. Now, there was a point in time when we were just beginning to start playing with technology and just start understanding what we could do with it. That was perhaps not the time to, you know, maybe it was, I don't know. I definitely wasn't, and I'm sure others were, though. Maybe it was the time to think about the impacts on society right then, and maybe we should have, especially with social media. But it was still early on. Unfortunately, I think we started seeing a lot of the harms play out, and it became ever and ever more increasingly sort of pressing for us to do something about it. So it's not so much a sea change, but uh, maybe perhaps late recognition that things are already happening and we need to do something about it. Okay, Suresh, we need to take a break, but we are going to continue this conversation in part two and I'm looking forward to getting down into the nitty gritty about how to operationalize the technical parts of AI. This is why it sort of bothers me a little bit when people claim that building trustworthy systems is against innovation. It is, it is in fact innovation. It is the right definition of innovation, coming up with cool new ideas to build systems that we can trust and rely on that do a good job for everyone. This has been Trust with Dominique Shelton Leipzig. If you want to future proof your business's investments in data and AI by adopting data leadership in privacy, security, and trusted AI legal frameworks, go to dominiqueshelton.leipzig.com. Trust, responsible AI, innovation, and data leadership is a production of Forbes Books.